Hello everybody, welcome back to In My Shed, I'm BC. A uh, bit more on my projects. I've been thinking about the Clarkson and why uh, taking the collar chuck out of the spindle bearing for the workhead improved the grinding so much. Uh, I know that it's shortened up the stick out out of the workhead and the Clarkson is quite a, a flimsy machine, very small table, can't absorb much vibration. So I started to put the digital verniers over to work here. And bugger me, uh, came to quite a realisation. The shaft behind the collar chuck is 25 millimetre. There's the rest of the chuck. You've seen that operating before if you've been here with me. Front of the workhead is 25 millimetre and the Clarkson bushes are 25 OD and in this case 20 ID to take Dominic's big cutter that we're about to grind back. But turn the bush over and it's one inch this end. So halfway along, it's 0.4 millimetre bigger, or a sixteenth hour. So realistically, this long shaft is only supported by about an inch and a half of the main bush that goes inside the body. The body is the same diameter all the way through, 32 millimetre. So I come to realise now that with this long shaft, it's only supported by this bit here, then the extension of the chuck body and then the cutter sticking out the front that's where all my vibration problems are coming in so by shortening up running back onto a bush straight in there the cutter is supported by a uh, plain section inside this body for the length of the bush so it makes it much more rigid but still not really what I'd prefer but I now have uh, the greater part of the problem solved the next grinding job is to come in here and grind the relief or the third clearance so that the secondary clearance doesn't have to be ground back so far. It is possible to grind this at the moment and as it is this secondary would work. You can see it a little bit better there I've ground past the gash in the middle but I feel that if this part is ground up a little bit better uh, the whole cutter will work better especially end cutting or plunging in the middle. Now it pays to get the grinding of these facets done properly and I'm still figuring that out. I could just go up to the bench grinder and hand relieve it back past the notch on both sides and let the notch do the job. But I want to try and do it on the grinder and pass through under a Type 1A1 or a plain wheel the way they would do that in the factory. So that'll be one of the jobs that I may not get to this weekend. But a bit of a realisation of why this poor old thing vibrates so much. It, it's partly me and partly it's a little bit flimsy. OK, over to the borer and we'll have another problem in the workshop. OK guys, here we are at the Kearns Model S Horizontal Borer for problem number two that I've got to solve. Uh, I've been scratching my head on this for some weeks now. Uh, two weekends ago I accepted the offer of a job by a young fellow that was desperate to drill some holes in a bit of aluminium but he didn't tell me it was a bit of aluminium billet about nine inches long and uh, I didn't have the height over the table of the mill uh, so I'll just throw it up on the borer so I bring it over here it would have been easy to put it up against the angle plates drill in from one end swap it over drill in from the other end and it'd be complete except I've got one big problem this is my Morse taper to inch and a half adapter and behind that the collar chuck, I can run a drill chuck exactly the same. And uh, this is the snout bar holder. Obviously the chuck goes, or the holder goes in from the other end. Uh, put it up on the uh, sliding face plate here. And the run out on the body and the run out on the sleeve was about six thou at the sleeve. And I said to the young bloke at the end of the nine inch block it's going to be about 56 thou so just can't do the damn job. And we tried to knock this about with a brass billet and it wasn't axial run out the problem that we had, it was radial. And for the life of me, um, I just couldn't find what the hell was wrong with it, so I had to drop the job. Now, I machined this when I built the snap bar extension, I'll oh, be a year and a half ago, and I thought I did it right. I turned the body of the snap bar holder uh, up on the lathe with a uh, live centre in the back end so that should be concentric with that 
I held that in the lathe chuck, mounted the snout bar holder onto the end that would live in there, tightened up the lock bolt and then faced it off. Now, even if that had radial run out in the chuck, that would give this radial run out, sure, but that doesn't matter a crap because that's adjustable on the slide, but it should have made that face absolutely perpendicular to the bore within a couple of tenths, you'd think. And uh, I thought, yeah, winner, winner, chicken dinner, this is an easy job. So mounted up there and I've made it even worse than it was before I faced it back off. So what the hell have I done wrong? I don't know. I'll be, I've got to cut it on the sharpen first, but then I'll be mounting it back up there, running the dial indicator on it. And there's not too many combinations because these keys only fit on one side. There's no slots on the other side. Uh, I couldn't see any problem. I did originally have a couple of thou. I could slide a feeler gauge in uh, beside it on one side and I cleaned up a few burrs and I'm pretty sure I had that correct. But the run out is that bad that it's just not usable. So uh, first I'll grind the cutter and then we'll either go on to the clerks and I'll come back here and see what we can do. And that's the dilemma for today. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. G'day everybody. Welcome back to Scratch Your Head. Because that's what I'm doing. Uh, I had this entire head apart to replace a worm gear you know, about two years ago now. And everything seemed to square up quite well. Uh, I did notice there's lots of whack damages all over the slides, etc. It was an ex-TAFE machine. I don't know whether the students were giving it a bit of paddy whack with a steel hammer or whatever. I de it as best I could. And the bottom side of the slide um, had a few dips in it, so I put it up on a surface grinder and I took about two tenths of a thou up, uh, as well as taking some of the dings out, but not enough material to get what I've got now. I think that me truing up the snout bar holder and taking material off the back face might have been me buggering things up. It could have been hand fitted to make allowances for a slide that isn't running too true. So I might have fixed it up and made it bloody worse. But if you have a look at the dial indicator, it's marked off in hundredth of a mil. We're up to 34 there. 31 there. So that's about a thou and a half. 29. 24. So that's at least two thou across the face in error. And you multiply that in the length of the snout bar holder compared to the depth in the slide there. And that sort of rings true. So what the hell do I do? It's going to take a little bit of tool making to get it running true again. I'll have a little bit of a think. Okay, I think I found a problem. And uh, it's not beyond me, but I don't want to do it the wrong way because these uh, slides are of fairly high tolerance, or fairly close tolerance, rather. And uh, you bugger that up and you don't have an accurate machine. And once that happens, may as well throw the facing head in a rubbish bin. Oh, I have been thinking recently of taking the facing head off, inverting it to a international 40 milling head as some of the later machines were, but I'm of two minds there because it gives you uh, the best versatility if you can use a snout bar holder, but not if there's this much error. Okay, I've got to think about this, so I'll leave it at that. I'm having a little bit of trouble editing the video, Mr. Windows and uh, the programs are complying. And also after this, I'll put a short clip in that I missed um, two weekends ago on the indexer on the wrong foo tool and cutter grinder. Uh, I was using a new microphone that I didn't know you had to turn on and I missed the audio in a couple of segments, but you might find it interesting as I describe that uh, indexing item. But uh, I'm going to clean this up. Uh, I think I'll take the slide out, uh, drop it onto uh, my surface plate and do a bit of metrology, but that'll have to happen next weekend. Okay, bye for now. Okay guys, this is round one, over and done with, and I have lost substantially. 
I can't find where it's out uh, and everything has to go one way. You can't change the two plates around. The slide can only go on one way. The feed screw can only go on one way. The snout bar holder is keyed only on one side. I've checked that the little drive dogs aren't jamming up in the drive slots and there's no light available between the mating surfaces. And this is what I've got. Wow! <laughs> and it's not lengthwise in the slot. It's out that way. So I'm going back to first principles. Um, after I fill my face with some food, I'll be clocking up the face of the um, facing head. And if that's not good, I'll take the plates off, I'll clock up the chuck body. And uh, maybe I have a man of the correctly on the shaft, I don't know. I thought I did a pretty damn good job. But as you can see, just not good enough. Uh, I finally ground that cutter and it's a bit of an odd bugger, it's seven flute and man it was hard to get clearance in behind the cutting edge. So a little bit of a hint, the facet angles were brought back from 27 degrees to 17 and a half and the cutting edge a little bit above centre and that helped. Okay, I've got a new lighting system now, I've got a uh, studio stand with a bit of a fill light with the screen on the front of it. Let me know what you think of the video, is it any better? And I'll come back after Smoko and have another go at this bloody facing chuck. Bye for now. Okay guys, here's another look at the indexer on top of the Wong Fu workhead. I know we keep coming back to the same subject, but I think a little bit more explaining is required. This is quite easy to fabricate yourself. Um, nothing fabulous here. Originally it came off uh, air spindle that was used for refluting end mills and cleaning up but it was just such a damn awkward thing to use for rotor brush cutters that we removed it. But it's a fairly um, simple and unique design. First up it's mounted on a piece of angle that is slotted and open-ended which is fairly important. So regardless of the diameter of the cutter and the position on the flute you can very easily move it both uh, side to side and back and forwards to accommodate where you need to get into the flute. Uh, sometimes you're indexing right up near the cutting edge, other times you're indexing right at the back to get the cutting edge in the correct plane, horizontal or a little bit above on the axis of the workhead. So that mounting bracket is fairly good. Now along the top there is a groove milled in there, just like a keyway, grub screw in the back of the front block and that stops this whole front block from rotating. There's an adjustment screw marked off in theirs, but uh, you don't need to have it marked off. And this grub screw here stops that body from rotating as you turn the screw to move this part up and down. Now as well as stopping that body, there's a groove in the uh, cylinder, in the thimble I think it's called. Now, not overly difficult to make at home. The indexing finger itself is just an old jigsaw blade that all the teeth ground off it and ground to a rounded point at the front there. Uh, back mounting is quite easy, just a lock nut either side of a threaded spindle. So something you can knock up at home. Uh, I find using just blocks with holes drilled through them for the rods quite easy. And in a previous video I showed just rods and blocks that I use to roughly affix an indexer on the Clarkson and in bugging me you find, hey, there's an easier way to do the job with a better indexer. But that's a little bit of a look at what we do on the wrong foot. Bye for now.